I have not walked in sunlight for years. No one speaks to me, to the point that I fear my voice will be lost, forgotten in the inky recesses of my mind, along with my name. The rats are my friends, or at least they do not cower from me. They look upon my ugliness with innocence, not knowing what horrors they witness. They are not enough. I must have someone with hands, a face, a mouth, someone human, even though I am barely that. I will not say someone like me. They must be beautiful. I cannot stand to witness ugliness, not even bearing to look at myself in a water pool. It is ironic. When I wish for someone to look upon, I share the same disgust which keeps me hidden away from others. I have watched many on the surface. Dancers, singers, musicians, the audience. Above my bed and grave is the opera house. Beauty is in their dreams. Everything must be decadent, wild with colour. When I first saw the place, I thought I had gone blind because it was so vibrant. Compared to the darkness of my home, it was like a star exploding. I once considered stealing away one of the singers, but there would have been an uproar. They would have hunted me down. So... I must crouch in the shadows like a rat and watch and yearn. I creep into the boxes to watch opera, comedies and tragedies, romance and despair. When I was younger, so raw and twisted from Persia, emotions a furious squall, I had laughed and wept with the rest of the audience. Quietly, of course, as an echo to their noise. Now, though, when I watch Romeo trip over the step as he always does and hear Juliet screech her love song, I cannot even bring myself to grimace. No longer do I clap or swear or bring out my letters to the pen a scathing review. The music cannot reach me. For a while... I blamed this on the managers. They were bores only willing to house popular shows to bring the mindless in. Never willing to try something original or daring for fear the paying public would flout out in disgust. So, in rebellion, I attempted to write a short piece they would have to consider, an attempt which never reached their desk. It was abysmal. The pages now rest in the lake, turned to nothing by the siren. It was light and hopeful, insipid, without soul or hunger. When I tried again, I could not even get past the first note. The fault lies with me. My music has left me. I have been underground for too long. My memories of Persia and the East, of the exotic and mystical, have crumbled into ash. Stagnation. Such an awful word. Slowly, my art left me as well. I painted dancers, singers and patrons. Anyone I spied through one of my mirrors. Features began to fade and smudge as easily as a thumb against graphite. Every single one of my sketches was of the opera, its architecture, and how well I know that. And my home, the last sketch, had been my coffin, empty and waiting. Am I like a page in a book, yellow and curling, so old that a single touch will turn it to nothing? Does my body know I am dying and is trying to tell me? No, I will not accept this. I will not crawl into death. I need to be out on the streets, listening to the beggars beg, women laugh, men argue. I need to feel alive again. But to do that, words must pass my lips. I dare not go out for fear of discovery. Discovery. 
disgusting. Am I that much of a coward, fearful of men? I would have willingly drawn their gaze, their fury and fists to strike them down. That had been before. I was cruel and thought I had been invincible, willing to scar a man to let him know what such a face is like to wear. A city is more of a threat than a desert. There would be nowhere to hide if I was discovered. They would hunt me down like a bored child swatting moths. In Persia, my strangeness was a source of question and amusement rather than hostility. The Shah was a tiresome man, only lusting for the brutality and death, blind to the beauty of it. Well, the Empress was a pitiful cat whose only pleasure was in ripping the wings from birds. The Roga was the calm to balance my storm, and Salome, she made me forget my mask. Dead now, both of them, lost to the Shah's sword and the Empress's traps. Traps that I made. All I wish is to hear someone speak my name. Still, I try to grasp some excitement, even though I have found no recent joy in terrifying the occupants of the opera. One fright, one screech of terror, and it might jolt me back into my usual humour. A chorus girl will peer into a mirror to check her too thickly applied makeup and see instead a skull's head. Rats found dozing on the pillows of an irritating diva, a snake coiled in the boot of a too inquisitive stagehand. And yet they feel like the uninspired tricks of a schoolboy. Something will spark off my imagination soon, or else I fear I'll never have it again. I leave my home, wander the passages. Every once in a while, I pull aside the slit behind a painting's eyes or prize out a small stone so that I may peer out to see what is happening. Some stagehands gambling in a corner. Elsewhere, the managers are smoozing some young pale-haired man, now desperate for another cash injection. A titter of laughter catches my attention down in the cellars, amongst the painted scenes put away from past shows, and the shushes are hissed in the shadows. The first to step out is the lead dancer, Sorelli. She passes painted deserts and bazaars, rainforests and cloud kingdoms. The woman is dressed finely tonight, in a red dress as dark and thick as rich wine, with a corsage of roses pinned around her waist and shoulders, neck thin and pale like a swan, and wrapped in shimmering gems which, at a more considered look, proved to be costume jewellery. Rouge has been thumbed onto her cheeks, pink smeared onto her pinch lips, and her dark hair knotted into an unkempt bum. She chuckles, and I realise her cheeks are not rouge but rubbed red from drunkenness. Come along, sparrows, Sorelli calls over her shoulder. The corpse de ballet follow. Jamez, Nexuri, Yama, Hepsi. None know me, but I know the names of every single person here. Know their secrets and shames. I could drown my like in coins if I had the urge to blackmail them. Many of the candles have ebbed, and so they stumble in the darkness. Most other times they would quail to be in the shadows, rushing to rehearsal or their rooms. They think the whispers of the wind scuttling through the bones of the building to be my laughter and the tickle of cobwebs my stroke. I am tempted to hiss in someone's ear or to show my flame's head to one and my crow's mask to another. However, they are too intoxicated to appreciate my trickery. There are bottles of wine clutched in hands, with not even a droplet to splash about inside. What are they celebrating this time? They take whatever excuse necessary, so long as they can get their lips on drink. Jemez and Meg, closer than sisters, dance together, 
and they're tumbling down some steps. Someone has already collapsed in a drunken heap, another tripping over her. They drink wine like air, yet never gain a tolerance. Sorelli's cheeks are spilt blood red, but she is still the only one capable of intelligent thought. Emma, pick up Eliza. Maria, stop swigging that bottle. It is empty. More won't appear just because you wish it. Do not sprawl, so Hepsy. It is without grace. Where are Michelle and Thomas? Jemez whines, staggering as she let go of Meg. They promised music. And more wine, Meg adds, scowling. I only hope that o o odious, I assume. Stinging lump of a man bouquet isn't with them. Have no fear. It is only I stalking you, and no doubt he would be able to follow the fumes if he wished. They'll be somewhere. Come, follow me. We don't want the managers to see us like this. We'll find an empty room. I intend to dance with whoever wishes to. Well, until sunrise. Sorelli curls her lip. Philip thinks he can drop me whenever he wants and I shall come begging. He will have a long wait. She picks up another fallen dancer, and all of them shuffle and latch their way elsewhere. One woman remains. I creep closer. What is wrong with her? She has not moved at all. Is she even breathing? There is something wrong with her flesh. It is hard to tell in this barely there light. It seems to be almost grey. Fright might have frozen her, keeping her scream caged in her mouth. I should go before she snaps out of her stupor and brings everyone racing back. I am so desperate to touch another human. I grasp her hand and it is colder than my own touch, impossibly hard. She is a statue used in some past production, although I can't recall which one, and abandoned down here. What a shame. She must be an imitation of a Grecian masterpiece, wearing a stone toga and clutching an amphora to her breast. Each limb is in perfect proportion, curved waist cocked teasingly, features gently chiselled in, as though she has shut her eyes in remembrance of her life before stone. I expect her to wake, look upon me, and cry in fright. That is impossible. She's frozen trapped in time. Such a beauty. I thought she was real. Stone cannot cringe in disgust. It gives me an idea. My dear managers, firstly, I must congratulate you on this month's production of Otello. The stab at Cyprus was a worthwhile attempt, and while Carlotta's harsh groans and her throes of death sounded more like a buffalo put out to stunt, death was quick to come for her. Otello himself was a pleasing sight, with her voice layered with soul, but I fear the audience's prejudice lack of appreciation will persuade you to replace him with the incompetent Piangi, hardly the passionate handsome prince who wooed Desdemona, racked with paranoia. However, this is not my reason for writing to you. It is only to offer a pleasant word and some helpful suggestions to sweeten the bitterness. I was disappointed to discover you have not paid my usual salary. I trust I have done nothing to offend you. I have refrained from setting fire to inaccurate, ugly stage pieces, whispering guidance to the conductor, and disrupting rehearsals. Perhaps it was the incident with the chorus master that you were upset with. I had only meant to let my presence be known. After all, I am sure you understand that if I did not show my face, so to speak, people would begin to forget not to dawdle in the shadows. It was his own fault he panicked and fell down the stairs, which is why, I regret to say, I must rescind my kindness. I will let my displeasure be known, and there is plenty of your latest show, Romeo and Juliet, I find much fault in. 
I fear if you were to show such a travesty to the public, I shall have to say something on the opening night. However, if you pay 40,000 francs, plus an additional 5,000 francs as an apology for your lateness, I will hold my tongue. If you are still hesitant then, upon the morning of you receiving this letter, there will be a surprise for the dancers when they go on stage to rehearse. An example of my frustration. Good sirs, I hope you will do what is best for yourselves. By evening, I am sneaking out of the opera, my pockets heavy and the manager's safe for another month. I wear another man's face, one sculpted and kneaded to resemble human flesh. It has a pungent, almost rotten smell, and it clings to me like seaweed. I cannot bear to wear this for long, but it is less noticeable than mask. To the curious gaze, I look like an old man with a face sunken only by the gouges of time. I walk with a slight hunch, fumbling with my walking stick. Men and women hurry by, staring ahead. Those with life still in their bones cannot bear the scent, taste or sight of death, as it reminds them of what awaits. It is late. Most of the market stalls have closed, but I have heard of one run by a young woman who sells statues carved by her husband. I shall find one of the pretty dancer and take her down to my home. My lips twitch and attempt at a smile. I will hide her in the shadows, drape her in silks, and speak to her and pretend that she answers. I truly have gone mad. Lamps are being lit. Leaves upon the ground are ruffled by faint winds. I smell smoke from the homes, yet it cannot chase off the sharp, rain-tinted crispness of the oncoming night. There is a crone in the way of my path. Her head is uncovered, and great swathes of bone-white hair gently curl around, though it looks like another gust could scalp her. To every passerby, she thrusts out her basket, hollering, Charms for the broken-hearted, charms for the wronged, charms for the poor and sick. Most wave their hand at her, as though flapping away a blue bottle. Her back is bent, the weight of life straining against her spine. Her cheeks are lumpen and thick, mottled with spots and warts. Her arms are brittle thin, like a rotten tree bending from the wind. Charms for the voiceless, she continues, more quietly, Head twisting slowly, charms for those who have never forgot their names. She stares at me, her thin, curving lips smiling unevenly. I lower my top hat and straighten myself more so that she sees how long my shadow falls upon her. Her eyes, like little dried up beetles, peer at me so that it tempts me to feel my face. It is as if she can see past my prosthetics. Leave me be, I hiss as she ambles over. She ignores me with a cackle. Come here, good man. I know what you want. Cautiously, I approach. Get this over with and be rid. She stares at me more keenly, frowning faintly. I won't pry into what you're hiding, she says, crossing herself. If you won't me, I can't tell her accent. I thought her a gypsy at first. But now I am wondering if even that is true. I doubt you have what I am searching for, I tell her. Leave me. Not a woman, then, I grit my teeth. Certainly not you. A woman not made of flesh, but desperate for warm human touch. I pause at what she says, as she laughs. I have you now. Look in here. She flips up the bar blanket, tilting the basket. It is full to the brim with clay. How does she manage to carry it? I thought you had charms in there. I carry whatever is needed. It is not enough, I say. I have much more. This clay came from a beach in Sweden where a young woman drowned in a wreck with her fire-limited father. None dare walk the beaches where they swear they hear the man playing and her singing on the winds. Make your woman, 
and she will sing as lovely as a bird, but she holds up a swollen finger. You must never tell her the tale of the singer or allow her to remember, else she shall shatter. My lip curls at such a foolish tale, and yet... The old woman took all that I had, and in exchange I received enough clay to create a woman. I had to use a hand cart to bring it down to the catacombs, and carried it across the water in my boat. I have sculpted from stone, carved wood, but never used clay for such a large-scale project. I plunge my hand into the icy lake surrounding me. My bones ache all throughout, the flesh beneath my nails turning purple as I run my fingers over one of the balls of clay. The impression of my touch is slight. It is only the beginning. Always, when painting or composing, I am gentle and minuscule in that first stroke of colour or droplet of ink. My mind is stirring. A million ideas flash before my eyes. It is a wild animal I have to grasp and tame, or else a dozen things shall begin and then be abandoned. Yet, rather than force myself to toss aside image after image, as I stare down at the clay, the climber fades. My face rises to the surface, staring back at me. My thumbs dig in, hollowing out the eyes. With the end of a paintbrush, I carve in the features. The arms are moulded, the fingers delicately stretched out, and her fortune mapped out upon the palms. I will know her more intimately than any lover, I who has formed the cage of her heart, the curve of her hip, the tilt of her smile. If there had been such a thing as God's, is this how they felt when they made the first woman? However, though I pretend that there may be a quivering heart hidden beneath the breast, or lips that can smile, I know she will never move, no matter the crone's promise. At least there will be something truly beautiful amongst the gloom. And if the candlelight flickers and the shadows dance, I might trick myself into thinking she listens to me as I sing. My only way of telling the passing of time is when the wax from the candles have melted into pools and the flame splutters and drowns within, the wick curling into uselessness. I do not go to replace the man. One by one, they splutter out as the darkness creeps closer. If I pause to replace them, my concentration shall break and wither. When she is finished, then I can rest. I work until there is no light, only the ethereal glimmer of the lake. My eyes narrow in the dark, aching, yet with mere touch I continue to form her. First, there was a ball of clay, a possibility, and it is as though suddenly I home. First, there was a ball of clay, a possibility. And it is as though I suddenly hold a woman. I wish to paint her hair yellow, as pale as sunlight glimmering on wheat, and put two opals in for eyes. It must wait. Clay is smeared across my cheek, clinging to my shirt, burrowed beneath my fingernails. The skin of my hands are red and cracked, blood weeping when I move my fingers, stinging from the water. I look at her and I become numb to the complaints of my miserable flesh. Somehow, I must figure out how to fire the clay down here, then she will truly be complete. I can dress and drape her in the finest of jewels. Anything she may want can easily be taken from the shops here in Paris, so long as they are reachable through my tunnels. Tomorrow, she will be as finely dressed as the high-class ladies who cling to the arms of their lord husbands. But now... Rest. Before I retire, I cover the statue in a sheet. Even though I am the one to make her flesh, it seems ungentlemanly to leave her with nothing to hide herself with. Then I stagger to my coffin, not bothering to wash and change. My dreams are fast and furious. The waves I picture consuming me. The ship struggles against the sea. The screams are as loud as the sound of the vessel tearing apart until all is swallowed and the silence comes.
a stir. Have I slept only seconds? I touch my face and find the clay there has hardened, cracking. What awoke me? I swear there was some sensation, a fluttering in my hair, like a breath of a breeze. Or fingers. Yet, no man he might have stumbled upon me would be gentle. I would wake to a boot stomping down upon my face. My hand goes to my mask to check it is still secure. Good, my face is hidden. It could have been a rat. They care little for personal space. I have found them curled by my feet before. A hand settles on my shoulder. I jerk away. The lasso is sharp against my fingers as I clutch it and grasp the intruder. Soon they will feel the embrace of the noose. I touch flesh that is as cold as the lake. Beneath the harsh dig of my nails, the slightest of cracks form. I look to the face. It is her. The woman I made.